Welcome to our reading on employee compensation. Now what we're going to be looking at in this reading is post-employment benefits and really that is going to be uh, two things we're going to be looking at. Uh, pensions and the other element will be healthcare. And then we're also going to look at share-based remuneration, so stock grants and employee stock options as well. Now, this is an area that has traditionally struck fear into the hearts of CFA Level 2 candidates, and it's because of the pensions. We're going to see two types of uh, pensions, defined benefit, defined contribution, one of which is incredibly easy, then one of which turns your hair grey overnight. So let's have a look at our first uh, learning outcome. It asks us to describe types of post-employment benefit plans and their implications for financial statements. So let's start off with pensions. Now let's have a look at a definition here. A pension plan is an agreement under which an employer agrees to pay monetary benefits to employees on their retirement from active service. Now that sounds rather like defined benefit to me. Okay, and we will distinguish between the two because we're asked to per the syllabus. Employee benefits, so the benefits you get post-retirement, are based on predetermined factors such as your average or final compensation. Well, it has, I have to say it tends to be based on final compensation. How many years you've worked so far and your age on retirement. So yeah, we're definitely describing a defined benefit pension plan here. Okay, so let's compare and contrast our two types of pension plan. Defined benefit, the type of pension plan we, if we all wish we had. Defined contribution, the type of pension plan that we all seem to have these days. Let's start with defined contribution. So let's start with our defined contribution. It's really dead straightforward here. All your employer is doing here is agreeing to pay a fixed percentage of your salary into a pension plan for each year that you work. Now, what that pension plan, what that, those assets are worth to you when you retire, quite frankly, is your problem. In other words, they're not guaranteeing fixed benefits that are going to be paid to you after you retire. They're just simply saying, hey, look, I'll pay in 10% of your salary into a plan every year you work for me. What assets those, uh, that those contributions uh, have invested in, what they're worth on retirement, hey, that's your problem. So notice, therefore, that it is the employee that has the risk. What the plan assets are worth when you retire is your problem. So, of course, we don't want, therefore, to be retiring in a recession when asset markets are particularly low. Asset ownership, well, you own the assets. It's the employee owns the assets. Your employer is just acting as an agent. They're just passing contributions into your plan each year that you work. And it does mean the employee gets to choose the investment policy, so you get to choose maybe the fund manager, the asset allocation, etc. Pre-funding, not applicable. Okay, again, there's no liability for the employer here. They paid in the contributions during your working life. What that pays for you on retirement is your problem. So they haven't got a liability because they're not promising future benefits at the date you retire, so they don't need a pool of assets to fund it. So they don't need to pre-fund. Now, let's turn our attention to defined benefit. Here, the key point is your employer is guaranteeing a fixed stream of benefits to you on your retirement. In other words, they're making a promise of fixed monetary payments when you retire. Now, that means they have the risk. It's the employer's risk because they've got the liability because they've made the promise that you're going to get these fixed monetary payments on retirement. Now, it means that they've got the liability but it also means they're going to own the assets. Now notice, of course, they are going to pre-fund here. They've got a liability because they've got an obligation to make payments to you on your retirement. Typically during your working life, they're going to pay contributions into a pool of assets. And the idea, of course, is that this portfolio of assets is going to be used to generate the payments to retirees on retirement. Now, because the employer has the liability, they make the contributions to the pension trust, they own the assets, of course. And it means, of course, they get to choose the fund manager as well. Now, of course, we're interested in these two types of pension and how, of course, they affect the financial statements and therefore ratios. So let's start off with defined contribution, because quite frankly, it is easy. Now, again, remember, and there we are, we've underlined it, 
the employer does not promise a specific level of retirement benefits. All the employer is doing is making a promise to pay into your plan every year that you work. Now, of course, that means, of course, the portfolio of assets that these contributions have purchased, the value of those is your problem on retirement. Now, it means the accounting is very simple indeed. Every time the employer makes a contribution into your plan, that contribution passes through the income statement, just like salary passes through the income statement. So we see an expense in the income statement equal to that year's employer's contribution. In the balance sheet, asset or liability, well, of course, if the employer has paid that year's contribution by the balance sheet date, we shouldn't see an asset or a liability. I guess we could potentially have a liability. If they were due to pay into your plan but hadn't done it at year end, there would be a liability sitting in the balance sheet being the contribution that they've yet to make. I guess there's a possibility of an asset. If they paid too much into your plan and you owed them some back, I guess we could see an asset. Now notice, of course, no significant issues for the analyst whatsoever. So that's it for defined contribution accounting. Now we said that this is a tough area of the syllabus, which means, of course, all the toughness must be related to defined benefit. So let's have a look at defined benefit. Two types, non-pay related. This is just a plan where the final payments to you are not based on your, uh, your final salary level. And I have to say that's pretty rare. Most of the pension plans we're going to encounter in the syllabus are going to be based on your future compensation. In other words, the payments that you get on your retirement are linked to your final salary. Now, as we said, the employer, who is the plan's sponsor, because they made a promise of future payments to you, they have the investment risk. They've got to ensure that they've got a portfolio of assets that they can use to generate the cash flows to you on your retirement. Because remember, they promised a specific benefit amount to you on retirement. Now, this is going to make it fairly tricky, the accounting, because we're going to need to have some measure of this liability, how much we're going to need to pay our employees on their retirement. Now, of course, once we start getting into that, we need to know how long they're going to live post-retirement and things such as that. And of course, therefore, we're going to need actuaries uh, to help us estimate the pension liability. So we need to estimate the future benefits that we're going to have to pay to our uh, to determine the contributions that we need to make into the plan. And this estimating of future benefits, of course, is going to be tricky and we're going to involve actuaries. Now, again, notice the difficult accounting and analysis issues. Certainly, the pension expense for defined benefit is not simply the employer's contribution into the plan assets. The balance sheet asset and liability, again, is going to be far more complicated too. So, let us have a look. Our next learning outcome says explain and calculate defined benefit obligations and it also mentions the funded status of the pension plan. So, we're going to start off with a definition of a PBO, which stands for Projected Benefit Obligation. That's the US GAAP phrase. And this is the liability measure. Okay, so essentially this represents the liability because the employer has contracted to make these fixed payments to you on your retirement date. So let's have a look at it. First of all, first line in there, it's the present value. The present value of all future pension payments earned to date. Okay, let's highlight that. We're going to come back to it and explain that. Earned to date based on expected salary increases over time. In other words, because it's based on expected salary increases over time, the payments on your retirement are based typically on final salary rather than current salary. Okay, so let's try and break this down. What we're going to do, essentially, is forecast out past your retirement date the cash flows you're likely to be receiving, and of course that's going to be based on your life expectancy. Now, these cash flows that you're going to be receiving are going to be based on your final salary. Therefore, we need to project what your final salary is, but earned to date. So it's based on our current service history. So if I've only worked for five years for the company, I'm only worth, going to get five years worth of benefit, if you like, on retirement. So it's based on how many years I've worked so far, of course, uh, 
but it's based on my final salary, assuming I work all the way up to the retirement date. So what we're going to do is estimate the cash flows that are going to be paid to our employees on their retirement based on their final salary and their current service history. We're then going to take that amount and we're going to discount it back all the way back to today's date. Remember, it's based on the present value. So it's the present value of payments we're expecting to make post-retirement based on final salary and current service history. Now, it assumes the employee works to retirement. It does. Because otherwise, your current salary, if you're going to leave now, your current salary would be your final salary. So because it's based on your final salary, there is that assumption you work until retirement. But remember, the payments are based on your current service history, not your final service history. So actually, when we look at the size of the payments, it's based on how many years you've worked so far, not how many years you will work if you work all the way to retirement. Yeah, it's an estimate of, of the liability on a going concern basis because it has that assumption that you can continue to work until retirement because it's based on final salary. Again, we could work out a liability measure based on a liquidation value um, if we were to shut the pension down right now. And it would be virtually the same, only the payments would be based not on your final salary, but on your current salary. Because of course, if the plan was liquidated right now, your current salary would be your final salary. And that's actually called an ABO, but it's not in the syllabus. Okay, now, under IFRS, we have a very, very similar measure to PBO. It goes by a different name. And it has the natty title PVDBO, the present value of the defined benefit obligation. It's the same thing. It's the estimate of the cash flows the employee will receive post-retirement based on their current working history, but final salary discounted all the way back to today's date. So really, the same measure, different name. Now, what goes in the balance sheet? What a balance sheet asset or liability do we see in our financial statements? IFRS and US GAAP now show the same uh, measure in the, in the balance sheet. They certainly didn't up until a few years ago, but they now do. So what are we going to do? We're going to show the net of the PBO. And I always think the PBO, of course, is really our liability measure. And the fair value of plan assets, which, of course, is the asset measure. So they're just going to net the two together and show either a net asset or a net liability. Now this net asset or liability goes by the name of the pensions funded status. So if the plan assets are bigger than the PBO, then of course you've got an overfunded plan and you show an asset on the balance sheet. If, and of course this is probably more likely, the plan assets are lower than the liability measure, the PBO, then you've got an underfunded pension plan and you're going to show a liability on the balance sheet. Now, we also uh, are, are asked to be aware of the components of the PBO. We're asked to not only explain, but also calculate the PBO. And to do that, both explain and calculate it, we need to know the components we're likely to see in the PBO. Now, what companies are required to do in their footnote disclosure is provide a reconciliation of last year's PBO, last year's liability measure, to this year's PBO. So we've got to reconcile opening and closing liability measure. Now, what we're going to see passing through the PBO each year, first element we're going to see is the PBO increasing due to service costs. This is the increase in the PBO because your employees have all worked one extra year. Remember, we said the PBO is the payments that are going to be made to you on retirement based on your current service history, but final salary. Well, of course, for every extra year that you work, you've got one extra year of current service history, and therefore the payments that you're entitled to will increase. So the service cost is the increase in the PB PBO due to employees' efforts over the year. Now, of course, what it is, therefore, is the present value of the additional benefit that you've earned for working one extra year. Now, interest cost. Interest cost. If you were to do nothing, the PBO would slowly get bigger and bigger over time. So if we hold everything else constant, the PBO would slowly grow. Why would that be the case? Well, because, of course, every year, we're one year closer to retirement. And remember what the PBO does. It estimates the cash flows that the employees are going to get on retirement, and then it discounts them back to the current date. So for every year we move through time, we're one year closer to retirement, and therefore we're discounting those cash flows back one fewer year. 
And of course, if you discount cash flows back one less year, the present value of those cash flows is going to be bigger. So therefore, the, the interest cost is simply the increase in the PBO due to the passage of time. Now, providing the discount rate used to calculate the PBO does not change, an actuarial assumption, so providing the discount rate does not change, we can calculate the interest cost by taking the opening PBO times the discount rate. Again, notice, subject to the discount rate remaining constant over time. If the discount rate changes because the actuary has changed their assumption, we actually have to go back and recalculate the opening PBO before we calculate the interest cost. Actuarial gains and losses. These are increases or decreases in the PBO caused by changes in actuarial assumptions. Now we're going to see lots of different actuarial assumptions, but they are things like the discount rate, they're things like the um, life expectancy of the employees, the rate of salary increases over time. So when the actuaries change their assumptions, then of course the payments to retirees are going to either increase or decrease. If we have an item that increases the PBO, so if an actuarial assumption increases the PBO, then we talk about it as being an actuarial loss. If an item, if an actuarial assumption decreases the PBO, then we talk about it being an actuarial gain. So we're going to subtract actuarial gains and add actuarial losses. Now again, within the PBO reconciliation, we're only talking about the actuarial gains and losses that affect our liability measure, the PBO. We're actually going to see there's another actuarial uh, gain or loss, if you like, caused by the difference between expected return on plan assets and actual return on plan assets that is not included here. The difference in returns on plan assets does not affect the liability. It doesn't affect the present value of what you owe your employees. So it's only the actuarial gains and losses that affect our liability measure, that affect the PBO. Now, past service costs, these are retroactive um, benefits, if you like, that are awarded to employees. Because we've changed the plan, we've changed it, we've made amendments to the plan. So we've got an example here. We've changed the final payout to six, from 60 to 65% of your final salary. Now, of course, that's an increase in the payouts you're going to get on retirement, and that would cause the PBO to increase. Okay. Now, of course, we might actually decrease. Maybe we're paying you 1% of your salary for each year that you work, and we suddenly change that to half a percent of your salary for each year that you work. Now, of course, that would cause the PBO suddenly to shrink and give us an, uh, essentially a gain. So, past service costs, if they make the PBO bigger or uh, essentially smaller. Then we've got the benefits paid to our existing retirees. These are going to make the PBO smaller. This is like you're extinguishing a liability by actually paying out to your existing retirees. Now let's put it all together. And here is the reconciliation that we're going to see in the footnotes. So there's the opening PBO, which of course is last year's uh, PBO figure. It increases by the service cost, the present value of the benefits earned because the employees have worked extra, one extra year. It increases by the interest cost, the increase in the PBO due to the passage of time. It might increase if we've got an actuarial loss. This is changes in the assumptions that increase the PBO, but it might decrease if we've got an actuarial gain. Actuarial assumptions, of course, that decrease the, uh, the PBO. Again, look, only the assumptions that affect the PBO. And again, for our exam, that means we don't look at the difference between actual and expected return. We'll talk more about that later. Past service costs, anything that increases the payments to the retirees will increase the PBO, uh, okay? And anything that reduces what they're going to get on retirement, of course, will uh, decrease the PBO. Remember, these are retroactively applied uh, to all uh, prior periods. We then reduce the PBO by the benefits paid out to our existing employees. So that's really our PBO. Remember, IFRS calls it the PVDBO. It's the liability measure of the plan. Remember, we do not see the PBO on the face of the balance sheet. What we see is funded status, which of course is the PBO netted against the plan assets. Let's have a little look at a PBO calculation. Very simple, just to give you a feeling of how this is working. We're going to keep it very simple. We're going to have a defined benefit pension plan with one employee. So let's have a look. Our retirement age is 65 and our pension plan is set so you get one month's salary times the number of years you've worked so far. Remember, PBO is based on your current service history. 
Life expectancy, our actuaries think our, our employee will live for 15 years post-retirement and the discount rate that they've chosen is 10%. So we've got one employee, Kevin Gallen. He's got 26 years to retirement. Well, if you retire at 65, 65 less 26, he must currently be 39 years old. Our actuaries have assumed that Kevin's final salary will be 36,000. So they've taken his current salary and inflated it over time uh, according to whatever they expect his salary to increase by. Okay, so they think his final salary is 36,000 and he started working for us at the beginning of the period. Now, of course, that means at the end of year one, Kevin will be entitled to one year's worth of benefits. So the retirement annuity that we've got here is $3,000. Remember, one month's salary uh, times years worked. So, of course, his final salary is expected to be $36,000. He's worked one year, and he's going to get one month's salary for each year worked, so one twelfth of that, and, of course, that is where the $3,000 comes from. So Kevin is going to receive $3,000 per year. Our actor is believe that he's going to live for 15 years. Okay, so let's work out the present value of the payments he's going to get at the moment of retirement. So we're just going to treat this as an annuity. N equals 15. The discount rate will be the actuarial, uh, the actuary's assumed discount rate. In this case, it's 10%. And the annuity is $3,000 per year. So N equals 15, IY 10, payment 3,000, compute the present value, and we get our present value at the date of retirement, 22,818. Now, what we then need to do is take that figure and discount it from retirement back to the current balance sheet date. Now, again, remember he had 26 years to retirement when he started working for the company. One year has now passed because we're at the end of year one. So there must be now be 25 years to retirement. So all we're going to do is take our 20, 22,818. There it is. We're going to enter it as a future value. The discount rate is going to be 10%. N is going to be 25. And we're going to compute the present value. So the present value of the 22,818 on retirement in today's terms is worth 2,106. Now that is our current PBO at the end of the first year. Now let's have a look at year two. Kevin has now worked for two years. He's now wor worth or entitled to two twelfths of his final salary. So essentially again, final salary no change there, we're still assuming 36,000, but he's now entitled to two twelfths each year for each year. So essentially, he's now worked two years. He's now going to get an annuity of $6,000 each year uh, for 15 years. Okay, again, the 15 being the actuarial assumed life expectancy. So you can see as actuaries <laughs> change the expected life expectancy, the PBO will either increase if life expectancy is increased or shrink if its life expectancy is reduced. Okay, so let's look at the present value of that annuity at the retirement date. He's expected to live 15 years post-retirement, discount rate from the actuary is 10%, the annual amount he's going to receive $6,000, present value of that 45636 Now, of course, that is the value of his annuity at the date he retires. We've now got to take that from when he retires to the current balance sheet date. Now, of course, at the end of last year, he had 25 years to retire. One extra year has now passed, so there are now 24 years left to retirement. So all I need to do is take that 45,636, discount it back for 24 years at 10%, and I get the present value of that amount to be 4,633. Now, of course, that is now the PBO at the end of year two. So we worked out the PBO at the end of year one, worked out the PBO at the end of year two. We've done a nice, very simple example here. We haven't changed any actuarial assumptions or anything nasty like that. What we're now going to do is try and reconcile, reconcile between last year's PBO figure and this year's PBO figure. So remember, last year's was 2,106. This year is 4,633. So there is last year's figure, 2,106. Here is this year's figure, 
4,634. Now, we haven't got any changes in our actual assumptions to keep this example nice and clean and simple. He's the only employee and he's not retired yet, so there are no benefits paid to existing retirees either. What that means is the only components that are affecting our PBO is this year's service cost and this year's interest cost. Let's start with the interest cost because that's dead straightforward. So we take the opening PBO, the 2,106, and we multiply it by the discount rate used, 10%. So that gives us, with a little bit of rounding, 211. Now remember, that's the increase in the PBO simply due to the passage of time, keeping all else constant. But all else wasn't constant in reality. Kevin had worked one extra year and therefore was worth what, or entitled to one year or one month's extra benefits on retirement each year. So what we need to do is look at the service cost, the increase in the PBO due to Kevin working one extra year. Now, of course, Kevin was entitled to an annuity of $3,000 in the first year. He worked one extra year. His annuity went up to $6,000. Therefore, the amount he earned, the increase he earned for working one extra year was $3,000. Okay, so what we need to do is look at the present value of that. So there's the incremental increase, the benefits he worked, gained for working one extra year, $3,000. That's going to last for 15 years, his life expectancy. Okay, so we need to work out the present value of that, uh, that amount. When we do that, essentially we have N equals 15, uh, I equals 10, and payment equals uh, 3,000. When we compute the present value of that, it, of course it's 22,818. Okay, now, next step, of course, is actually to note at the end of year two, you don't get the 22,818, you don't get this extra benefit from working one extra year until you retire. So we need to take that back 24 years. So take the additional benefits earned from working one extra year, discount back 24 years at 10%, and that gives us our service cost. The increase in the PBO because Kevin worked one extra year. And you can see, therefore, opening PBO plus service plus interest gives us closing PBO. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the plan assets, if you like, the other side of our plan. So again, we saw a reconciliation between opening and closing PBO. We're also going to see a reconciliation between opening and closing plan assets. What are we going to see? We're going to see employer's contributions. These are the monetary amounts that the employer has paid into the plan assets during the year. Of course, it's a function of uh, tax, uh, employment, retirement and savings act rules and then cash flow considerations. It's also a function of the funding status or the funded status of the pension. If you've got an underfunded plan, the employer contributions are likely to rise. Overfunded plan, they're likely to, to shrink or, or stop altogether. Okay, so you've got the employer's contributions, the amount the employer is paying into the plan. We've then got the actual monetary return on plan assets. Now again, key thing to note here is that it is the actual monetary return on plan assets, not an expected return on plan assets. So it's the actual capital gains, dividends, interest, realised and unrealised gains and losses on the portfolio. Now of course, this actual return on the plan assets will fluctuate with the market. Boom times, bullish markets, the, act, the actual returns are going to go up. Of course, uh, bust times, bearish markets, the actual returns will drop. We then also have the benefits paid to our existing retirees. Now, this is exactly the same figure that went through our PBO reconciliation. Because essentially what we're doing here is liquidating the plan off assets to pay down the plan liability. So let's have a look at our reconciliation. There's the fair value of plan assets at the start of the year, i.e. last year's closing figure. We then add on the actual return on plan assets. Again, assuming the, the returns are positive, we're adding. If we'd made a loss on the portfolio, of course, we'd be subtracting. We then add on the employer's contributions, the cash flows that the employer has pay, paid into the plan during the year, and then finally deduct benefits paid out to existing retirees and that will give us the plan assets at the end of the year and it's simply the fair value of plan assets the market value of plan assets 
and we're seeing this disclosure reconciled in the footnotes. Now, as we said a little bit earlier, what we actually see on the face of the balance sheet is not the PBO and it's not the plan assets, but in reality it's the net of the two, both under IFRS and US GAAP. So what we're going to see in terms of the balance sheet asset is the fair value of plan assets less the PBO. So of course, uh, essentially, you're going to get a negative funded status if the liability measure, the PBO, is greater than the plan assets. So if the fair value of plan assets is greater than the PBO, you're going to get a positive number and it's an overfunded plan. We create an asset in the balance sheet, whereas of course, if the PBO is bigger than the plan assets, then of course we've got a negative figure, it's an underfunded plan, and we're going to show it as a liability. We're quite happy with that as an analyst. We believe that now, both IFRS and US GAAP, the asset that we see in the balance sheet is the true economic position of the plan. So we're really happy with that. Funded status, great, is the true, true economic position of the plan. Now do note, and I don't think this is the biggest worry uh, that you've got in the exam, so if you are reporting an asset, uh, notice there is a maximum asset value, a ceiling on the asset value equal to the present value essentially of any economic benefits. Okay, I wouldn't worry too greatly about that. Now our next learning outcome, now this is important, describe the p components of pension cost. Okay, so we're going to talk about the total economic cost of running your plan. And this is often known as either the total periodic pension cost or simply the periodic pension cost. So again, if they call it periodic pension cost or total periodic pension cost, it means the same thing. Now, there's going to be a number of different ways that we can calculate the true economic cost of running the plan. And that's what this is, the true economic cost of running your plan for one year. Now the most simple way of calculating it, and we are potentially going to need to calculate it in the exam, is to take the employer's contribution, so this year's contribution, minus the change in funded status. So if funded status is improved over the year, we're going to subtract it. If funded status has worsened over the year, we're going to add it. We'd have minus minus if it worsened, etc. Okay, so notice this year's employer contribution minus the change in funded status. Okay, so we're looking at the change in funded status. Okay, so that is the total periodic pension cost. Now, again, it's quite hard to interpret it just by saying, oh, it's the employer contribution less the change in funded status. What it really is is it's the total cost of running the plan no matter where that cost has been reported. So what it's actually going to make, be made up of is the income statement expense plus any items that have gone directly into stockholders' equity. Now remember, stockholders' equity is cumulative, so if we've got items in stockholders' equity, we need to look at the change in those items to get this year's gain or loss in those items rather than simply looking at the year-end balance sheet figure. So the total periodic pension cost is the total cost, whether we've taken it to the income statement or whether we've taken it directly into stockholders' equity. Now another absolute key point to take into the exam here. The total periodic pension cost, the true economic cost of running your plan for one year, is the same under both IFRS or US GAAP. So total periodic pension cost identical under both methods. Ah, but here's the kicker. Where this cost goes, i.e. the split between the income statement, the pension expense, and what goes directly to stockholders' equity, that differs under the two methods. Okay, so that's the problem. Where the pension cost is reflected in the financial statements, i.e. income statement versus other comprehensive income, and remember, of course, OCI is a component of equity, that is where it differs. And of course, we're going to need to know what those differences are, what that split is between IFRS and US GAAP. So let's turn our attention to the income statement under both US GAAP and IFRS. What goes through the income statement? Well, you can see, uh, first of all, we've got the recurring actual costs, the service cost, the interest cost. That will go through your pension expense, making the pension expense bigger. 
Now these service costs and interest costs are exactly the same ones that have gone through the PBO. In fact, they're simply the other side of the double entry. So the service cost increased the PBO, the interest cost increased the PBO, and they'll both go through as an expense in the income statement, increase in the pension expense. Now, from these recurring actual costs, we are then allowed to deduct the return on plan assets. And again, here's something really important to note. It's not the actual return on plan assets that we're deducting here, it's the expected return on plan assets. Now remember, when we looked at the reconciliation of plan assets, our reconciling item was the actual return on plan assets. But here, in the income statement, we're using the expected monetary return on plan assets. Now again, uh, essentially we can calculate that as opening, asset, opening plan assets times percentage expected return. Why are we using expected return, not actual return? Well, we've got an element of smoothing here. Companies essentially argued that if they had to put the actual return on their plan assets through their pension expense, it would lead to a volatile pension expense because every time the financial markets fluctuated, the return on plan assets would fluctuate. So you get a volatile pension expense and therefore volatile earnings in the income statement. Therefore, it was argued we should be able to dampen this volatility and therefore use a long run actuarial expected return on plan assets rather than the actual return on plan assets. Now, this is going to give us another source of gain or loss. The fact that we're using expected return in the income statement, but we use actual return in plan assets. We'll turn our attention to that in a little while. We then have amortization of actuarial gains and losses and amortization of past service costs. Now, I don't want you to worry too much about these two smooth events right now. We need to explain uh, why we have these in just a second. I think what you need to know is if you amortize an actuarial gain, it's going to make the pension expense smaller. If you amortize an actuarial loss, it's going to make the pension expense bigger. Same with past service costs. If the past service costs had increased the PBO, when we amortize it, it will increase the pension expense. If the past service costs had decreased the PBO, when we amortize it, it will reduce the pension expense. Now, what we're actually seeing is the amortization of items that were taken directly to other comprehensive income. Okay, so these actuarial gains and losses prior to their amortization and these past service costs prior to their amortization are sitting in stockholders' equity within the other comprehensive income. We'll talk again more about that in a second. Now that gives us our pension expense that we see on the income statement. So what are we going to see in stockholders' equity? Well, we're going to see the unamortized past service costs and any unamortized actuarial gains and losses. So that's what we're going to see sitting in OCI under, of course, U.S. gap. Now, let's turn our attention to the income statement expense under IFRS. So here it is. Now, straight away, it looks a lot more simple. We've got a lot less uh, items going through. We've got the service cost. Now, that again is the, inc uh, the, the increase in or the present value of the increase in benefits because employees worked one extra year. In other words, it's exactly the same item that we see in the PBO reconciliation. So, IFRS and US GAAP both put the service cost. But then, US GAAP had the interest expense. And then, of course, it deducted the expected return on plan assets. Notice IFRS just shows one line, the net interest expense or income. Essentially, you need to know that this is really the interest expense less the expected return on plan assets. And of course, that's either going to give you a positive number, uh, essentially, if the expected return is less than the interest expense, then of course, we're going to have a net interest expense. Or if, of course, the expected return is greater than the interest expense, then we get interest income. Okay, so actually under IFRS, we're seeing these two components netted against one another. Now, there's a very good reason for that, and we're going to talk about it on the next slide. So uh, I will come back to that and explain why those are being netted. Now, notice another big difference. We've got the past service cost. Now, under US GAAP, we saw the past service cost. 
But it wasn't the entire past service cost we saw hitting the income statement. It was only the amortization of the past service cost. So again, we've got a big distinction here. IFRS says, if you change the terms and conditions of the plan, and of course that, that's retroactively applied, it's a, it meets the definition of a past service cost, the change in the PBO needs to be immediately expensed. So again, if it's made the PBO bigger, this is going to be a big uh, loss that's hitting the income statement and therefore increasing the pension expense. If the past service cost made the PBO smaller, then it's of course going to reduce the pension expense. But the entire amount hits the income statement in the year that you make the past service cost amendment. US GAAP very different. Under US GAAP, when you make a past service cost amendment, we initially take it into stockholders' equity, not via the income statement. But then the rule under US GAAP is it needs to be amortized over the remaining employee life. So when we saw US GAAP and we saw the amortization of the past service cost, it was because initially it had gone to stockholders' equity, but was now being amortized over the remaining working life of our employees. Okay, let's try and explain. The other thing that you, you'll notice is, is slightly different under IFRS. There is no amortization of actuarial gains or losses. Now, under both US GAAP and IFRS, actuarial gains and losses are going to be taken into other comprehensive income. But then what happens to them is rather different. Under IFRS, they just sit there. Whereas under US GAAP, they may have to be amortized according to a 10% corridor rule. Again, let's not worry about that right this second. Just be aware, actuarial gains and losses initially go to OCI under both US GAAP and IFRS, then may need to be amortized under US GAAP, won't need to be amortized under IFRS. Now let's try and explain why we're seeing net interest income and expense under IFRS, but we're seeing the gross elements under US GAAP. Well, the major reason is under US GAAP, Firms can choose their own discount rate and expected return, or the actuaries will. And they can be different. So the percentage, the discount rate can differ from the percentage expected return on plan assets. As a result, US GAAP says these two items, the interest expense and the dollar expected return on plan assets, must be shown separately. Now again, assuming discount rates and expected returns don't change during the year, Notice the interest expense can be computed as opening PPO times the discount rate. That gives us our interest expense. And the expected return on plan assets, opening plan assets times the expected return to get our dollar return on plan assets. Now, here's the difference with IFRS. IFRS says you cannot have different rates. You must use the same rate for your expected return as you do on plan assets. And in fact, Sorry, you must use the, the same rate for your expected return on plan assets as you do for your discount rate. So discount rate and expected return on plan assets must be the same under IFRS. It actually goes further. Under IFRS, it says that discount rate that you choose should be uh, essentially the yield on AA rated corporate debt that has a, a duration similar to the plan liabilities. So in other words, the discount rate is really being determined for us under IFRS. And once you've got your discount rate, that too must be your expected return on plan assets. So they're going to be the same. So what IFRS does is it takes opening funded status. Now opening funded status, of course, is opening PBO minus uh, opening plan assets. So we take opening funded status times the discount rate, and that will give us our net interest expense or income. Now, of course, if we've got an underfunded plan, in other words, an, uh, a liability as our funded status at the start of the year, and we multiply that by our discount rate, we're going to get a net interest expense. If we've got an overfunded plan, i.e. an asset coming forward at the beginning of the year, and we multiply that by our discount rate, then we're going to get net interest income. So these two items are netted because you are using the same rate for both under IFRS. They're shown gross under US GAAP in the income statement, or certainly in the, in the footnotes, because essentially you can use different rates of return. So our learning outcome says explain and calculate the effects of assumptions, in particular with focus on how it affects the liability, the 
PBO, the projected benefit obligation, or the PVDBO, the def- present value of the defined benefit obligation. So we've got to focus on how it affects our liability measure and also how it affects the periodic pension cost. So notice all plans have to not only make but disclose, so we're going to see these disclosed in the footnotes, a number of assumptions. Now, three assumptions need to be disclosed. Be aware that there are far more actuarial assumptions, such as life expectancy of the plan participants, split between males and females, gain different life expectancies. Even left-handed versus right-handed people have different life expectancies. So there are tons more assumptions, but three need to be disclosed in particular. And that's the discount rate that has been used to calculate the uh, PBO. The rate of compensation increase that has been used to calculate the final salaries and the expected return on plan assets. Now again, we said US GAAP only because remember under IFRS, the discount rate and the expected return on plan assets must be the same and furthermore, IFRS tells you that that discount rate must be the rate on AA rated corporate debt uh, that matches the duration of your liabilities. Okay, so, again, there's more scope, therefore, to manipulate these assumptions under US GAAP than there is IFRS. IFRS has really closed this down. Now, as we change these assumptions, they're going to affect either the PBO, okay, uh, which, of course, will affect funded status, or, of course, they affect the pension cost. I say or, it might well be an and or. So they're going to either have an impact in in the balance sheet via funded status or in the income statement via the pension expense. Key point, though, is by altering our actuarial assumptions, we could alter the pension expense in the income statement, and that would have a direct impact on our earnings. Okay, in other words, this could be used for earnings management. In particular with US GAAP, remember, because we have that greater scope, because we can set not only the discount rate, but the expected return on plan assets. Okay, now we need to know how our uh, actuarial assumptions, the three disclosed actuarial assumptions, are going to affect both the liability and the income statement. Higher discount rate, let's start off with a higher discount rate. The actuary has increased the discount rate, that's going to give you a lower PBO. No doubt about that. The PBO is the present value of the benefits that you're going to pay your retirees. Higher discount rate, lower present value, lower PBO therefore. Okay. What about a higher discount rate in, on the pension expense? Now, what we've got to think about here is service cost and interest cost because both are going to be affected. Now, service cost is the present value of the benefits because your employees have worked one extra year. Higher discount rate, lower present value of benefits earned for working one extra year. So service cost definitely is going to go down, no doubt about that. Interest cost, people get a bit bogged down here. They think higher discount rate will be higher interest cost, and that's not actually necessarily the case. The reason people are making this mistake is because they've learned interest cost is opening PBO, times the discount rate. So, not unreasonably, they're saying, well, look, actually, if the discount rate goes up, that gives me a higher interest expense. Well, in reality, it's not as simple as that. If you change the discount rate, yes, the discount rate goes up, but you actually have to go back and recalculate what opening PBO would be under the new discount rate. So, of course, a higher discount rate is actually going to cause the opening PBO to drop. Now, as a result, typically, Typically, we find that the interest expense is lower. In other words, we find the impact on the, of the opening PBO dropping is greater than uh, the impact of the discount rate rising. So overall, typically, we get a fall in the interest expense. I said typically, why am I saying typically here? Well, it rather depends on the remaining time to retirement of the employees. Assuming there is some time, a significant length of time until the employees retire, then typically the interest cost is actually going to fall when you increase the discount rate. If your employees are all very close to retirement, then you actually can find that the decrease in the PBO is actually smaller than the increase in the discount rate and therefore the interest expense rises. Again, if I was asked in the exam, I would say it's far more likely that if we increase the discount rate, the interest expense, the interest cost actually falls. 
Okay, so again, interest cost falls for pension plans other than those that are extremely mature. So our pension expense is indeed going to be lower. Higher wage rate increases. Now, of course, if you've got a higher wage rate increase, then the, you're going to pay your employees bigger payments on their retirement because, of course, the benefits are based on final salary. So higher salary, higher payments, higher payments, higher present value of payments, and therefore higher PBO. No doubt about that. What about the pension expense? Well, again, that's going to be higher. We don't need to worry about interest here. It's just to do with the service cost. Now, the service cost is the increase in the PBO due to employee benefits in the year, and it's based on your final salary. So higher final salary, higher service cost. So that's going to go up. Higher expected return on uh, plan assets. It does not affect the PBO. No, the PBO is the liability measure. If we change our assumed rate of return on the plan assets, it doesn't affect how much we owe our, our retirees. So there's no impact on the PBO. But of course, it is going to have an impact on the pension expense. Again, remember, the start off under US GAAP, we have service cost, interest cost, and then we deduct the expected return on plan assets. So a higher expected return on plan assets, this element is going up, and therefore the pension expense is coming down. Notice the star that we put there, US GAAP only, Remember, under IFRS, you do not have control over your expected return anymore. It has to be the same as the discount rate. And indeed, you don't have much control over your discount rate anymore. It has to be the long run return uh, or the long run yield on uh, AA rated corporate debt. Now, again, it does mean that under US GAAP, the actuaries theoretically could choose an unrealistic expected return. Again, there is a way the analyst can kind of test this. Not only do they need to disclose the expected return as a percentage, but they also need to disclose the uh, tactical asset allocation of the plan as well. So we could look at the asset allocation uh, and, and, and look at the expected return and, and, for, and, and compare them essentially for, for reasonableness. So we can do a bit of reasonableness checking as an analyst on this expected return. Now, delayed recognition of pension costs. This is the bit that really gets people confused. What we're really talking about now is the amounts that go into other comprehensive income. So certain amounts go into OCI. Now remember, it's a component of stockholders' equity and it, therefore it's a component of the balance sheet. Remember, of course, balance sheet items are cumulative over time. They build year on year. Therefore, if we ask for this year's gain or loss, it's always going to be the change in the other comprehensive income item. Now, let's have a look. Under US GAAP, these events are amortized to the income statement. Until then, they sit in OCI. Remember, we saw when we looked at our income statement, the amortization of actuarial gains and losses and the amortization of prior service costs. Now, let's have a look at what goes to other comprehensive income. Under IFRS, it refers to them as remeasurement gains and losses. Now, these are gains and losses caused by changes in the PBO as a result of changing the actuarial assumptions. So we've got actuarial gains and losses, and really these are the ones that affect the PBO. An actuarial gain, if it makes the PBO smaller, actuarial loss, if it makes the PBO larger. But there's another source of gain and loss, and that's the difference between the actual dollar return on the plan assets and the expected return on the plan assets. So actually what we do is we take the actuarial gains and losses that affected the PBO and we add on the actuarial gain or loss caused by the difference between actual and expected return on plan assets. IFRS then refers to these two sources as remeasurement gains and losses and it takes it directly into other comprehensive income. US GAAP doesn't call them remeasurement gains and losses. What IFRS calls remeasurement gains and losses, US GAAP calls actuarial gains and losses. Okay, now isn't this confusing? Because part of remeasurement gains and losses, IFRS called actuarial gains and losses. Just be aware, when IFRS says actuarial gains and losses, it's only talking about the assumptions that affect PBO. When US GAAP talks about actuarial gains and losses, it's a talking about the assumptions that affect PBO plus the difference between actual and expected.
So in other words, what IFRS calls remeasurement gains and losses, US GAAP calls actuarial gains and losses. So here are two main events, remeasurements, difference in the actuarial assumptions that affect the PBO, and as well, differences between actual and expected return on plan assets. Now naturally, if the actual return on plan assets is greater than expected, you get an actuarial gain. If actual is lower than expected, you get an actuarial loss. Okay, note under IFRS, the expected return must be the discount rate. We know. Okay, so those are our remeasurement gains and losses. The other delayed event that we get are past service costs. Now remember, this is US GAAP only. Very different treatment of past service costs. If you change uh, the, the, the terms of the plan and that has retroactive impacts on the PBO, then US GAAP allows you to take the increase in the PBO or decrease in the PBO directly into OCI and then amortize over the remaining service life of the employees. IFRS does not. If you have a, a, a prior a past service cost, it affects the PBO and the entire amount must go through the income statement expense in the year that that change is made. Okay, so past service costs you're only going to see sitting in OCI under US GAAP. You're going to see them expensed immediately under IFRS. Okay, so again, just trying to summarize this up. We've got the plan assets, the difference between actual and expected returns, actual bigger than expected, a gain, actual smaller than expected, a loss. Okay. On, on the, uh, the PBO side, again, the three major actuarial assumptions, certainly the ones that are disclosed, the discount rate, the rate of salary increase, etc. But again, remember, there are lots more, such as the composition of participants, male, female, um, of, of course, the life expectancies, etc. So any of the actuarial assumptions that cause the PBO to change. Again, if it makes the PBO bigger, it's an actuarial loss. If it makes the PBO smaller, it's an actuarial gain. So we net those two, and then they are taken typically into other comprehensive income. Now again, you should be aware that actually US GAAP gives you a choice. Either you can take the actuarial gains and losses immediately through the income statement, or you can choose, if you want, to defer them by taking them to OCI and then amortize. Now, if you take actuarial gains and losses into your other comprehensive income under US GAAP, they may need to be amortized in future periods. Notice that phrase, may. They may not as well. IFRS never amortizes the actuarial gains and losses. Now, the reason IFRS doesn't amortize actuarial gains and losses, what IFRS, remember, calls remeasurement gains and losses, is because of the prudent assumptions that have been used. In other words, the discount rate, well, that's the rate of yield to maturity on AA rated corporate debt and the expected return on plan assets has to equal that discount rate as well. Meaning essentially we're using a pretty low expected return on plan assets, far more prudent. Therefore, for example, let's take actual versus expected returns. Under IFRS you'd expect them to reverse. If we've currently got a loss because our actual is below expected, later on, because we're very prudent, we'd expect that loss to reverse. So IFRS, it really takes the view that these remeasurement gains and losses should correct. Now under US GAAP, of course, there's no such restriction on our expected return on plan assets. So if we choose something that is wholly unrealistic, the expected return on plan assets could be permanently bigger than the actual return on plan assets, causing, if you like, uh, our actuarial loss just to grow and grow and grow and grow. Now, what US GAAP says, therefore, is if these actuarial gains and losses get too big, they need to be amortized. Now, this amortization corridor approach is what US GAAP does to ascertain whether they're too big or not. Now, what US GAAP says is you will need to amortize if the beginning gain or loss, so this beginning gain or loss, this is the amount sitting in OCI at the start of year, So if the beginning amount in OCI exceeds 10% of whichever is higher, so note it's the greater opening PBO or opening plan assets. So if the amount in OCI for actuarial gains and losses is greater than 10% of opening PBO or plan assets, then you're going to have to amortize. 
Now, of course, if your pension plan is underfunded, then it's going to be the greater of 10% of opening PBO. If you've got an overfunded plan, then it'll be the greater of 10% of plan assets. Okay. Um, now, of course, we also amortise the prior service costs under US GAAP. There is no 10% corridor there. Now, it, the amount of the opening uh, actuarial gain or loss that exceeds that exceeds this corridor has to be amortised. In reality, US GAAP gives you a choice. You can either amortise the full amount sitting in OCI or only the amount that exceeds the 10% channel. And we actually amortise over the remaining service life of our employees. Now that's all pretty complicated and we're going to take you through a large numerical example in class to hopefully bring these ideas together. Let's just have a little look at a comparison of IFRS to US GAAP. So notice I think our real, real key point to take away is under US GAAP expected return and discount rate may well differ, whereas under IFRS of course they must be the same. So that has a knock-on impact on the income statement under US GAAP the interest expense and the expected return on plan assets are shown separately, whereas under IFRS, because we're using the same rate, we're going to net the two together. Other differences, IFRS remeasurements go to OCI and that's it. Now remember the remeasurements, the actuarial gains and losses and the difference between actual and expected return on plan assets. Under US GAAP, remeasurements, which of course US GAAP calls actuarial gains and losses, they Notice, can either be recognised in the income statement, so if you make an actuarial gain or loss, you have the choice of putting it through the income statement in the year it's incurred. What's actually far more likely, though, is it gets taken into other comprehensive income and then gets amortised over subsequent periods. So notice our opening OCI, uh, the opening amounts in other comprehensive income, are subject to potential amortization according to that 10% channel. IFRS, of course, we have no amortization. IFRS past service costs are immediately taken to the income statement. Remember, under US GAAP, that's not the case. They go into other comprehensive income, then get amortized over the remaining service life of the participants, plan participants. 10% corridor approach for amortizing uh, remeasurements actuarial gains and losses as US GAAP calls them, there is no corridor because there's no amortisation under IFRS. The discount rate under IFRS, again, is actually determined as being the yield on high quality corporate debt and the accounting standard actually mentions AA rated, uh, essentially, with similar duration, so with a similar life to the plan liabilities. Okay, US GAAP, the discount rate, they say it needs to be the rate at which pension benefits can be settled. In other words, the rate at which you could uh, eliminate or unwind your, your pension plan. Right, some other adjustments. <laughs> some other adjustments. Uh, we're asked to explain and calculate adjustments, how they affect the financial statements and ratios. Now, under US GAAP, the full pension expense is taken through operating expenses. Typically, it passes through sales, general, and admin. Again, realistically, you'd actually have to split it. The pensions that relate to your workers involved in the production process would have to go through cost of goods sold. The other element uh, would pass through sales, general, and admin. But essentially, it's taken through operating expenses under US GAAP. Now, what we're going to argue is actually only the service cost is an operating expense. The remainder, let's think about the major components. Let's forget amortization for a second. The major components are service cost, interest cost, and the return on plan assets. Now, the argument is the interest cost, that's not part of your sales general and admin. That's an interest uh, expense. So maybe we should add it to the interest expense in the income statement. And, of course, the um, return on plan assets, maybe that should be treated as other income, certainly not operating income. So maybe the component elements of the pension expense should be shown in different areas in the income statement. Issue is, with US GAAP, they're only treated as operating and therefore only going to be in sales, general admin or cost of goods sold. IFRS, interestingly enough, does allow us to split between the various elements of the income statement. So you could put 
service costs through operating expenses, interest costs through the interest expense and actual return on plan assets through non-operating income. It allows you to do that. I've never actually seen it done, but it does allow you to do it. Okay, so what we might actually want to do is actually, uh, this last little point is saying maybe you want to remove the pension expense from the income statement and replace it with the true economic cost of running the pension plan, which of course is the total periodic pension cost that we mentioned earlier. Now we're also asked to interpret cash flow related information. Now again, um, certainly under US GAAP in particular, the full employer's contribution, of course that's the cash flow element from the company's point of view, it's not the pension expense, it's actually the contribution they're making to the plan. Now what that means of course, is there is a difference between what passes through the cash flow statement, the employer's contribution, and what goes through the income statement, the pension expense. And of course where we've seen differences in the past, they've resulted in deferred tax assets or liabilities. So there is an implication for deferred tax assets and liabilities with your pensions. You will be delighted to know that the syllabus does not mention deferred tax in any way, shape or form. Okay, now, essentially the employer's contribution all passes through cash flow from operations. Now, here the syllabus wants us to make some adjustments. Now notice what we're saying here is if the employer's contribution is greater than the total periodic pension cost, that is like a principal payment. Now why are they saying this? Let's go back to total periodic pension cost and just remind ourselves of what it was. It was the employer's contribution minus the change in funded status. Okay, so what we're saying is, if the employer's contribution is bigger than the total periodic pension cost, funded status will improve. That's what it's saying. Now, an improvement in funded status is going to reduce the liability, of course. And reducing a liability, remember it's an interest-bearing liability, uh, a pension liability, that's like paying off debt. The syllabus then goes to argue, when you pay off debt, that cash flow passes through CFF, not CFO. So what we should do, therefore, is adjust our cash flow from operations and our cash flow from financing. So what we do is we take the employer's contribution minus the total periodic pension cost. This is the improvement, if you like, in funded status. We multiply by one minus tax. Now again, we multiply by one minus tax because the tax on the pension all passes through CFO. And this net amount, we're going to decrease CFF as if we're paying off debt and increase CFO to keep it balancing. Now on the flip side of that, if the employer's contribution is lower than the total periodic pension cost, then funded status is going to worsen. And that's going to increase therefore your liability, and that's like borrowing. And the argument is when we borrow, of course, the cash inflows come through CFF, not CFO. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the difference net of tax this time and increase CFF and decrease CFO. So be aware of those little cash flow adjustments. Again, uh, it's certainly something that could well be examined. Now you'll be amazingly relieved to know that we've got to the end of defined benefit uh, pension accounting. It is certainly one of the trickiest areas uh, of the syllabus. You'll be pleased to know actually, or maybe you won't be pleased to know, it has actually become uh, simpler than it has been in the past. It was even more confusing in the past because funded status was not shown uh, on the balance sheet. So whilst it is still wildly baffling, at least it's a little bit easier than it has been uh, in prior years. Now, let's talk about our other post-employment benefits. The big one here that we've got is healthcare. Much, much easier. Um, it's classified as a, de a defined benefit plan. Um, essentially, with a healthcare, your employer is agreeing to make healthcare contributions after your retirement. Now, of course, this typically means they're going to buy healthcare insurance for you. They're going to pay the premiums. So the liability is the present value of the expected future payments. These expected future payments are therefore the premiums that they will need to pay to buy your health insurance. Now, typically, it is not funded in, a, in advance. In other words, we don't have a pool of assets out of which these premiums are met. What that means is it's always going to be a liability, so it's not funded in advance. Now what it does mean though is to calculate that liability, 
That liability must be the present value of premiums that are going to be paid over your retirement period, i.e. from the date of retirement until you die. So the problem is they're going to need to work out how these, what these premiums are likely to be on your retirement. And that's going to require your actuaries to essentially estimate the increases in healthcare costs. Now, what we typically do uh, for healthcare costs is we make an assumption that healthcare prices are inflating over time. I don't think that's a particularly controversial, but we assume that initially uh, we've got high rates of inflation, so high increases in premiums, and then sl over time we will taper off to a long run constant rate of inflation that is known as the ultimate healthcare trend rate. Okay, now, what they do need to disclose in the account is what the short-run inflation rate in healthcare is, the ultimate healthcare trend rate, so what the long-run rate will be, and how long it will take us to move from the short-term high rates of inflation to the long-run ultimate trend rate. And that allows us to review how uh, conservative or aggressive uh, their accounting is. So again, the higher the near-term increase, the more conservative the plan is, the higher the long run trend rate, the more conservative the plan is, and the longer the time we take to reach that long run rate, the more conservative the plan is. Again, really for an analyst, we're going to need to compare between companies to see how aggressive or conservative their assumptions are. Okay, we now finish up this area where we need to explain the issues and the accounting treatment for share-based compensation. And there's really two types that we're looking at here. Stock grants, where we're giving essentially free shares to the employee, and stock options, where essentially we're giving our employees options, i.e. the right to buy shares at a future date at a given price, of course. Call options, essentially. Only difference is these are not traded call options, so they're not traded on an exchange. Another big difference is of course, if you exercise an employee stock option, the company creates brand new shares. Whereas options that are traded on an exchange, if a call option is exercised, uh, essentially the seller of the option just uh, transfers existing shares. Okay, let's start off with our share-based compensation. Now, our major advantage here is no cash outlays. Now, of course, if we pay bonuses to our employees, that's cash leaving the company. Salary, that's cash leaving the company. Giving them some free shares, hey, no cash outlays. So that's a definite bonus. And notice the argument as well is it aligns management and shareholders' interests. Now, we love to refer to this as agency costs. So actually what it's going to do is reduce agency costs. Remember, the agency cost is every, you get agency cost every time the uh, managers essentially act in their own interest rather than in the shareholders' interest. Well, of course, if the managers are now shareholders, by maximising shareholder wealth, they'll also maximise their own wealth. So it should reduce agency cost. There are some disadvantages. We're giving our employees free shares, but it's unlikely that any individual employee can influence stock price. Well, Maybe they can destroy stock price, maybe by uh, bringing the company down, but it's harder to have a, uh, an upward effect on the stock price, certainly. And also, there's a notice, increased stock ownership typically increases risk aversion. We're not going to want to do anything now. We're not going to want to take risk that could uh, have a detrimental impact on the stock price. So we might be overcautious. Compared to stock options, if we give people stock options, then that might increase risk taking. Imagine you've got a, some employee stock options and they're currently out of the money. So I don't know, let's say that the strike price on these options is $15 and the current share price is $10. Now they're out of the money. You're not going to want to exercise your right to buy at $15 when the shares are only worth $10. So what that means is employees might take excessive risk to try and drive the company's share price up from $10 beyond the strike price of $15. So too much gambling might happen so that the options essentially vest in the money. Now, of course, the other major problem with giving away free shares is that the existing shareholders are diluted. You're, if you give a chunk of new shares, you create new shares in the company and you give them to the employees, then of course the percentage ownership of your existing share, shareholders is diminishing. And of course they might not like that. 
Yeah, we're going to be a little bit aware of our disclosures in a set of financial statements. Nothing too excited here. Notice the nature and extent of the share-based compensation. So we're going to have to mention the if we've got any stock grants, what the employees need to do to earn those shares, if there are any restrictions on the shares, um, stock options, we're going to need to disclose those, what the strike price is, how long until they vest, etc. So we need to disclose the nature and the extent of any share-based compensation. How fair value was determined? Now the idea is we determine the fair value and we're going to then spread that over the service period. It's like uh, what it's going to do is it's going to be treated as rem uh, rather like remuneration in the income statement. So it's an expense in the income statement and of course that reduces net income. Uh, so if it reduces net income it reduces retained earnings uh, in the balance sheet. Rather interesting, the counterbalancing transaction is to increase additional paid in capital to keep the balance sheet balancing. Okay, so we're going to spread our uh, fair value, if you like, over the service life. Now that does therefore require us to estimate fair value. So if it's stock grants, what are the value of the shares that we've given away? If it's stock options, of course, we have to establish the fair value of the option. In other words, we have to estimate the option premium and then spread that over the time to expiry. Impact on the in uh, income for the period. Remember, essentially, it's going to reduce. Uh, we spread the fair value over time and, of course, it reduces net income. And we keep, and if it reduces net income, of course, it reduces retained earnings. To keep the balance sheet balancing, actually, within equity, whilst retained earnings has gone down, we increase additional paid-in capital, typically, to keep it all balancing. Okay, so we're going to allocate fair value over service period. Let's look at our stock grants, first of all. So here, the compensation expense, the expense in the income statement, is the estimated market value of these shares at grant date when we give the shares away. Now that's easy if you're looking at a listed company, it's whatever the share price is when the shares are created and given away. If, of course, you're looking at an unlisted company, it might be hard to establish fair value. Now, it's going to be allocated through the income statement over the period benefited by employee service. And notice, that is deemed to be the current period. In other words, we typically put it through uh, the income statement in the period where we grant the shares. Notice as well, restricted stock. We might issue restricted stock where the ownership has to be returned to the company if conditions are not met. Typically, this is linked to length of service. So we say to the employees, here, have some free shares. But if you leave the company within the next five years, you have to give those shares back. So it's typically length of service. It could be performance goals. So here, have some free shares. But if our return on equity drops below 4%, you have to return the shares to us. OK, so notice performance shares. These are shares, stock grants, that are granted not because you've worked for the company for a length of time, but because the company is meet certain performance targets. So I might give you free shares if our return on equity hits a target, if our stock price hits a target. So it could be linked to accounting data, could be linked to stock price. Again, just be a little bit aware with performance shares. Once we start granting performance shares, that does provide management with an incentive to manipulate the financial statements. They might want to manipulate the financial statements to make sure they receive those shares. Stock options. Now, the fair value when the options are granted is the estimated option premium. The service period is simply the time between the options being granted and the first date on which those options can be exercised, essentially. Now, we're going to spread that. So if we've got a, an option, we, give, we grant you the option now, but it can be exercised in three years' time. We'll take the option premium and we'll spread it straight line over three years. So it'll go through the income statement in three instalments. Now, how do we ascertain the fair value of an employee's stock option? Now, first of all, what the accounting standard says is if we have similar options, so options with similar terms and conditions, that are traded in a market, so traded on some kind of exchange, you know, Euronex Life or uh, the big Chicago-based exchanges, then we can use the premium of these options that are exchange traded. Now, it seems to me that it would be very unlikely that you have a load of employee stock options that happen to mirror uh, traded stock options. 
So in the absence of a market-based instrument, which I think will be most of the time, then essentially we're going to have to establish fair value by using some option valuation model. Now, of course, the counting standards then give us three choices. BSM, the black shells merton model, and of course we visit that in derivatives. The binomial model, so cox ross rubinstein's development using risk-neutral probabilities coming from black shells. Uh, the binomial model, and then finally Monte Carlo simulation. Now, whatever method you use, there's a number of inputs going into it. So all models require six assumptions. The exercise price, well, that's a given. We know what the strike price of the option is, the price at which the employee can exercise and buy the shares. The stock price, the current share price, when those options are granted. Okay, and of course, those two first factors allow us to assess whether the option is in or out of the money. Volatility. Ah, now, of course, remember the volatility measure is not historic volatility, what the volatility of the stock price has been. It's actually the volatility of the underlying asset from the date the option is granted to the date the option is exercised. Now, there's a problem. Again, unless you've got some kind of crystal ball, there's a lot of assumptions going on there. Risk-free rates. Again, assumptions on option pricing is that it's known and constant. Time to expiry, time until the option can be exercised, again, not too controversial. And, of course, dividend yields uh, as well. Dividend yields tend, of course, to reduce option premiums. It's the red one. It's the volatility assumption that we are concerned with. Okay, higher volatility, higher option premium. So what we're saying, therefore, is there's an incentive for firms to underestimate volatility to get a lower fair value on their option premiums so there's lower impact on the income statement. Finally, we get to stock-based appreciation rights. These are essentially cash bonuses linked to stock price performance. Okay, so we're not going to give you shares themselves, but what we will do is we'll give you a bonus linked to share price performance. Now, the advantages of this, of course, is I'm not creating new shares, so there's no dilution of my existing shareholders. Also, there's less risk aversion. And typically, you only get uh, these bonus payments when stock prices uh, perform, when the stock price goes up. So therefore, it avoids less risk aversion. If I give an employee shares, then they're worried about share price declining. With stock-based appreciation rights, you don't get a bonus if the stock price declines. So I'm going to be less maybe risk averse, no downside here. The disadvantage is, well, it's the cash outflow. It's a cash bonus that's being paid and therefore it actually has implications on the firm's cash flows. And also, of course, it has an implications on the firm's earnings as well. We need to essentially expense this bonus as if it's remuneration. It's going to increase the employer's remuneration, reduce net income, uh, of course, in the financial statement. Right, keys to our exam. Pension accounting, gosh, yeah, be aware of your terminology. PBO, service cost. In particular, know what's in the balance sheet, funded status, and I think knowing the total periodic pension cost and how it's split between the pension expense and OCI under both US GAAP and IFRS is important. Again, within defined benefit pensions, knowing how the actuarial assumptions, in particular the three that are disclosed, i.e. Uh, discount rate, expected return on plan, assets and final salary increase. And know how those impact the financial statements and therefore your ratios. Okay, uh, calculating adjusted cash flows. So again, this idea that uh, contribution bigger than total periodic cost improves the funded status. That's like paying off debt. Contribution less than total periodic cost funded status worsens and of course that's like borrowing so know how to adjust the cash flow. Then finally your share based compensation I don't think I'm that excited but certainly no stock grants and stock options.